Good morning, everybody. Uh, trying to go live, and uh, I, I tried to use the calendar or the scheduled thing again, and it, it didn't take off, so that's why I'm a minute late, um, which is crazy. I've been late to a couple of things this week, and it's driving me nuts. So, uh, good morning, and uh, thanks for joining me today on uh, Coffee with Shane, which for the sake of my uh, my bride and other people I may run into today, I'm just drinking water because um, I had one coffee this morning, and um, <clears throat> I think I'm doing pretty good. And so I'm on to water now because it's important that we do this. I, I hope you guys are doing well. Um, <clears throat> I, I know that... Uh, that we're all anticipating and 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 praying and expecting, uh, you know, God to start doing some stuff and changing things. And I'm I'm um, I'm in the same boat, and I'm excited about <clears throat> watching God work and and seeing the Lord even, you know, working through um, through all the muck and mess of the political system and uh, everybody's personal and 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 uh, agendas and all the stuff that gets mixed into this. I hear you. I get it. Um, I am uh, today, as you know, some days you get discouraged, other days you're hopeful, but today I am I am hopeful because I believe that God is sovereign and he's able to handle these things and he's going to handle these things. And as we move forward, the church is going to be stronger. The church will be, uh, will be more in line with what his will is for us. We're going to learn from this and grow from this and, and God's going to use it to do awesome and great things. Um, so th for that, I'm, I'm, I'm excited and I anticipate, um, God doing some great stuff. So good morning, you guys. Good to see you all. Uh, today we're going to be in Romans chapter five. And the reason I want to share this with you is that, uh, you know, after the, our time last night on Wednesday nights with Stefan and I at going through James and, and it's easy for me at times to get pretty discouraged about the, the, the strength of the text and the depravity of my own heart and the difficulties that I think that we have in dealing with that tension of, of what's, what we see in our lives and then what we see in Scripture that talks, that where God talks about what should and shouldn't be there. And, and it's really easy for us to get, um, to get discouraged in that. And <clears throat> this week as I was um, actually talking to other people, um, God gave me, uh, I wouldn't say gave, I mean, he gave it to all of us. It's a scripture, but it, he took me to this passage and it was one of the things where as I was reading through it, it just really encouraged my heart. And I wanted to share that with you today as we prepare for uh, getting together on Sunday via our live uh, broadcast again and not actually being in one another's presence. Um, and so uh, my hope is that this will be an encouragement to you. You will, you will hear the text. You will um, experience what I experienced with the Lord in this week. And that is just um, a great encouragement, a great uh, focus and, uh, of hope. And, and it would turn our eyes back to what God's doing and, and what his ultimate purposes are. So <clears throat> grab your Bibles, open them up to Romans chapter 5, and we're going to read a few verses. Good morning, you guys. Good to see you all. Um, I see several more people signing in. Thanks for joining me. I, I really appreciate you being on here. Hey, would, if this is encouraging to you, if, if you're watching this and you find this encouraging, please share it. Um, when you guys share um, this, it gets out to a lot more people. And um, we're able to, to encourage and hopefully uh, have opportunity to get the gospel out to more and more people um, as the Lord opens the door and as people are searching for it. So um, that would be awesome. So please share. And, and if you do share, be sure to put a note in there of why this is important or how this has been encouraging to you, um, why somebody would be interested in watching this. It, it's, um, it's super important. So uh, Romans chapter 5, uh, we're going to begin there. Starting in verse 1. Uh, <clears throat> the text says this, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. 
For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. What I, one of the things I love about this, this particular passage, uh, the, the first aspect that we have to recognize that was, that was a reminder for me to get my eyes on the right stuff is that our hope, uh, uh, regardless of what we're going through, the peace and hope that we have comes through Christ. It's, it comes through the character and nature of God, not our understanding of him. Um, it, it doesn't come through our ability to even reproduce it or explain it. It's based on his character. So even when we doubt, even when we're discouraged, even when we're struggling in life, the character of God has not changed. And so the availability of hope, his, his ability to deal with our, the, the, the suffering that we're in, his ability to help us, uh, to, to give us endurance, to train us, to develop our character, to take us through all of these things in our suffering, all of that is the reality of who Christ is and as he takes us through it, that's one of the things we're learning in James, right? That when he tells us to consider it pure joy, when we face these things, it's because we know that God's character and who he is actually takes these difficult things and develops in us the character that we need to have, that he's designed us to be in, and that ultimately leads us to his presence and his likeness at the end of our lives. And so what a great what a great reality and hope that that is that you and I have as we consider what the difficulties that we may face, whether it's attitude, whether it's sin issues, whether it's physical suffering or, or, or mental or emotional suffering or uh, any of those things that would, would be involved in, in the complications and the difficulties that we may face. How, how significant is it that it's the character of God that establishes that? That is the, it's the foundation for those things that you and I trust in. It doesn't change. It, it doesn't change. Go, if you go back and read the Old Testament, you'll actually see that repeated over and over again. In fact, this Sunday, we're going to go back and look at uh, in Exodus where, where Moses is being introduced to God. And it's so incredible when you see the character of Christ, when you see the things that are talked about, about who Jesus is and, and, and the blind man that we're going to look at on Sunday asking for mercy. And, and that's in the title of who God is as he introduces himself to Israel. And, and before that, you watch Israel struggling over and over and over again and Moses going back and, and pleading with the Lord not to destroy him because of the sinfulness of their hearts, the, the stubbornness of their hearts. And, and yet in that, God still introduces himself as his merciful, long-suffering uh, God who, who has steadfast love um, for, for all these people. And so that's the hope that we have. That's the foundation of the hope that we have. And then it's demonstrated in when he came and offered us salvation, when he came and rescued us. It wasn't when you and I had turned around. It wasn't when mankind recognized their sin and recognized their need for God. He offered the solution. What is Romans 5, 6 says? For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for us. In our weakness, he died for us. Later on, it says, while we were yet sinners, he died for us. While we were still in our sin, when we hadn't repented, we hadn't recognized our need for that. And then later on, he says, while we were his enemies. So here we have this picture of Jesus dying on the cross. While we were weak, while we were sinners, while we were his enemies, God moved towards you and me. Again, not because of us, but because of him. Not because of anything that we've done, but because of his character and his faithfulness to his character and to his love. And, and, and so when we think about our hope, when we think about his salvation, when, even when we go back and we look at, let's say, the darkness of our heart, the, the wickedness that comes out of our hearts when our mouths open up, when, when things come off of our, out, out of anger or frustration or when we're in fear or anxiety, when those things pop out of our mouths, we can actually stand in the hope that, yes, I see the blackness of my heart. I see this reality. And yet here we also see the hope and reality of Christ and the work that he did on the cross and that you and I can, by faith, we can say, okay, Lord, I'm a wreck. I'm a wreck, but I trust in the work of Christ on the cross. That's my hope. That's where I rejoice in. That's what I have faith in is that it's Jesus's work that has actually redeemed me. And it's in knowing my condition, knowing who I am and where I was at, that he actually entered into that relationship and said, come, I will make this right. And, and a key passage of this 
is in verse 9, where, where he says this, Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. And so, I think so often when we think about our sin and we de- we struggle with the fact that we, we struggle with sin and we go back to sin, <clears throat> even when we don't want to and we end up back in that moment, back in that frustration in, in, in the sin that we're in, I think sometimes we think that, that you know, God... When he's coming as judge, he's, he's just waiting to slap us around. He's waiting to discipline us. He's antis- you know, he, he, he's he's got all this wrath built up because of sin. And when I get discouraged about my sin, there's times where I feel like he's justified in in exercising his wrath on on me even. And yet, when we look at the text, when we look at the the the, the uh, it's almost like a tension in the text, right? There's the wretchedness of our heart, and there's the reality that that he's going to judge the the actions of our hearts, and he's going to, he, I mean, Jeremiah 17, 9 said that he's going to see those things, he's going to judge them, because our hearts are deceitful, and we don't know them. We, we can't evaluate them, but God does, and he's going to judge us based on that. And, and we see even in the New Testament that there will be judgments for the works that we've done. In fact, what does he say in Matthew 7? He tells the people who are testifying, they're claiming to be people of him, saying, Lord, we did all these things in your name. But he says, depart from me, I never knew you. So yeah, there's this, there is a tension. There's this idea that the things that we do, James even says, show me your faith by your works. And so we have this picture and this this tension of, man, our works don't line up with what we say we believe. We struggle to, to live in obedience in everything. We struggle to trust Christ in everything. Um, we, we struggle to not be anxious about life or to get frustrated about the things that we see happening in and around, in and around us. And yet, with that particular perspective, there's also the the opposing or the almost an opposite perspective that creates tension in the believer's life that says, yes, but we're also, we've been justified by the blood of Christ. Our sins have been paid for. The wrath has been taken. The, the punishment has been paid. In Hebrews 10, 14, remember it says that with this one sacrifice, he has for all time perfected those who are being sanctified. And so, yes, when we see the wretchedness of our heart, when we see that reality, we should confess it. It should cause us to fall on our face and worship the God of, of creation and, and confess that sin. And then by in hope and joy, we testify to the glory of God and we again engage in the relationship and we, 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 we're disciples and we follow him in that moment because of the work of Christ on the cross. Because while we were weak, while we were sinners, while we were his enemies, he died for us to set this right, to pay the price, to put in place the opportunity for you and for me to be reconciled to God and to be his children. To walk in hope, to, to, to walk in rejoicing in the kingdom of God and the glory of God in the midst of people who don't have hope, in the midst of a world that is lost and dying and deceived and are still weak and sinners, and enemies of God. It's in that condition that Christ saved us, and it's in that condition that he wants us to be light, to live in hope, to rejoice in who he is in the midst of a world that is in the same condition that we were in. And because of that, because of that reality, Paul says this in Romans 5.11, More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now been or received reconciliation. So our testimony, our praise, our rejoicing does not come because you and I have mastered the sinful heart. You and I have mastered behavior modification. Uh, 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 This whole idea of us pretending in church that we've got it all figured out and we have nothing wrong in our lives and sin isn't an issue for us is hogwash, you guys. It's filthiness. I think it's a lie of the enemy. Yes, we're supposed to pursue the Lord. Yes, we're supposed to live like Him. Yes, we should confess our sin. Yes, we are to be examples uh, uh, to, to, to other believers, and we're supposed to help one another where we're weak. But it doesn't mean that we pretend that we're not 
struggling with sin. It doesn't mean that we pretend that we don't struggle with this tension between being made perfect by Christ while still being sanctified, while, while being weak and sinners and his enemy, Christ died. And, and, and because of that, because of that reality, the sin that I'm struggling with, I can confess freely. I can let go of it. I can give it back to the Lord. And then I can walk with him in hope and joy and peace. That's the hope that we have. That's the beauty of salvation in Christ. There's nothing else in the world that offers this reality. There is no other hope. There is no other truth that says in the midst of your wretchedness, in the midst of your brokenness, I'm going to restore you. I'm going to pay the price. I am going to redeem your life and put it back to the way it was designed to be in a right relationship with God so that you and I can worship him, so that you and I can live with hope and peace in the midst of chaos and, and, and painful uh, suffering at times. And, and we, we're not even suffering as great as many, many believers are across the world. Is that encouraging? I hope that's encouraging to you. It really lifted my spirits this week. To be reminded of who we are in Christ, to be reminded of what he did on the cross, to be reminded that God is sovereign and that in his perfect timing, he met us at our weakest, most broken state and he provided the solution. And then he promises through suffering to, to build endurance, to build character, to, to actually complete in us the work that he started. That when we're done, as James 1 says, when we're done, we'll be perfect and complete. When these trials have completed, when they come to uh, fulfillment, when God has finished testing our faith, when he, when he has finished refining us, we will be perfect and complete in his presence. And as his children, he will receive us and say, well done, good and faithful. So don't ignore the tension. Don't try and cover it up. Don't, don't look at your life and see the wretchedness that is there. See what God reveals in your heart and, and try and ignore it or dismiss it. Don't do that. Confess it. Acknowledge that, yes, God, this does not honor you, and I want to confess that sin. Because when we confess the sin, 1 John 1, 9 says that he is faithful and just and, and cleanses us from all righteousness. He puts us in the right spot that we're supposed to be, and it helps us to live free. It helps us to, to live with hope and joy. Because when we confess it, he covers it. He, he, he pays. It's already paid for. But really, he's probably just reminding us, hey, goofball, it's paid for. Stop. Stop running back to that. You don't have to live that way. You don't have to live in this sin. You're choosing to. Knock it off. And that's what I want my heart to do when I confess is say, God, I know that that's sin and I don't want that anymore. I chose to go there, but I, I, I now, right now I'm choosing to say no. I'm choosing to honor you. I'm choosing to follow you. That's part of what confession is for us. God already knows that we're a mess. God already knows what our sin is. He paid for it. He did it before we even were ready. So when we confess, we're not telling him anything he doesn't know. We're, we're straightening out our thinking. We're straightening out our hearts. We're aligning it with God, with his character. And then he covers and fixes and, and restores and brings hope and starts transforming our heart from stone to flesh. You and I can't do that. I don't know if you've tried. Have you tried to fix your heart recently? Have you, have you tried to deal with whatever sin is in your life? You know what? God, I promise from now on I'm never going to do that again. This is my... I'm going to start right here. I don't know if you guys have ever done that. I can't tell you how many times I've started. I've done that to try and show him that, that I mean business this time or I'm really in it. I think that's why in Romans he reminds us it was while we were weak, while we were sinners, while we were his enemy, Christ did this because we were never not going to be in that condition until he makes the change in you and me, until he transforms our hearts. I hope that's encouraging because it's encouraging to me that God is in this. He, he, he's doing it. He did it before we were ready. He's going to do it when we're not ready now. He's in the process of changing our hearts and transforming us, making us holy, setting us apart for his purposes, completing what he started in us. Don't give up. Don't, don't give in. Don't, don't be complacent with who you are. Don't accept the, the sinfulness in our hearts and just say, well, I can't do it, so I might as well just, I might as well just keep sinning. That's not the response that we're supposed to have. We're supposed to see this and say, God, you're right. 
You are good. There's hope in this. And when I see sin in my life, I will confess it. And I'll put it before you and acknowledge it for what it is so that you can continue to do the work that you've promised to do in me when I confess and when I surrender. My hope is that this is encouraging to you, that you will read and engage in the Word of God this week, and that when you see the sin in your life, you'll confess it. When you are discouraged, you will grab a hold of the Word of God and let Him overwhelm you with His peace, with His kindness, with His mercy, with His joy, with all the things that come from having hope in an eternal God that lives outside of time and is established for all time, the the redemptive plan for His people in the midst of their lives, in the midst of their sin, before they were even ready, and He met with us in that moment, at that time, and prepared the way before we could have even engaged him. And it's that God that tells us that he is going to win. He has already won. The end is already established. The enemy is already defeated. I think it's Second Peter that says he's just being patient with us. He, so, because he, his desire is that none would perish, that his desire is that we would be disciples and that we would shed the light, we would, or we would share the light with all of those around us. And and he knows who's coming, and and he's being patient for us, with us, so that we would do what we've been called to do, so he can complete in us what he started. What a great joy and a great truth that that is for my own heart, and a reminder that I can trust him in these things. Well. That's the encouraging word that God had put in my heart this week. That's how he encouraged me through this text. And my prayer is that you would experience that same encouragement today. God bless you as you pursue him, as you you follow him in his word and in your daily life. I just pray that God would bless you in, in endurance and boldness to be the disciples he's called us to be especially today. There are people that need to know this hope. There are people that need to have this reality demonstrated for them, watching someone else like yourself and like me go through difficult times and still testify to the goodness of God and the hope that we have in who he is. God bless you guys today. Have a wonderful afternoon worshiping God in everything you do. See you guys on Sunday.